I'm Barbara Snyder, president of Case Western Reserve University, and I'm pleased to see all of you here this afternoon. The Ford Lecture is a real treat for me on two counts. First, of course, it brings some of the most interesting and innovative minds to our campus every year, and this year, of course, is no exception. Second, it affords me the opportunity to spend time with one of the university's greatest and most genuine supporters, Alan Ford. Alan has been a tireless and enthusiastic champion of this university for decades. He joined our Board of Trustees in 1976 and chaired it from 1987 to 1992. He received the university's highest honor, our University Medal, in 1994 to recognize his outstanding contributions to Case Western Reserve. More recently, Alan and his late wife, Connie, launched the Ford Visiting Professor Series. This initiative exists to highlight our world-class biomedical engineering department and has brought such renowned speakers to campus as the inventor of the Segway, for one. It's really been a great series, and Alan, again, we thank you for a wonderful opportunity to bring somebody great to our campus. So please join me in thanking Alan Ford. Alan. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce the leader of this world-class department, Professor Jeff Dirk, who will tell you about this year's speaker. So one of the great things about being chairman of the Biomedical Engineering Department at Case is we have opportunities like this to celebrate our successes and the generosity of people like Alan and the guidance and the wisdom that he shared with me and also the fact that he gives me great assurance knowing that he'll be here to uh, sort of take the opportunity to give me the guidance and the wisdom I need to lead this department in the vision that he so well established. It's also important, I think, that we point out that there are other people in the audience that we need to thank for this event, uh, specifically Dominique Durand, who's the chair of the 2008 Ford Lecture, uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. Dominique. <laughs> and of course, Kathy Gill from our department, and Ann Borchardt from Development, who also provided their generosity in terms of time and planning. So charged with the vision that Alan and, and Barbara articulate in terms of the integration of engineering and medicine that established the Ford Lectureship, one of the tasks that Dominique had to, and his committee had to take on was finding a lecturer who delivered upon the promise of the integration of medicine and engineering. And it's with great pride that I have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Michael Mesrick or Merznick, I'm sorry, as a 2008 Ford lecturer. Michael has received numerous honors, and I could st spend the next 50 minutes of the time, I think, going over these. He's published over 200 manuscripts and has over 50 patents in the field of, field of neuroscience and biomedical engineering. But for just moment, one moment, I'd like everyone to remain as silent as they can. Now imagine experiencing that silence for 200 million times longer, or 30 years. And it's essentially one of the privileges of, of Dr. Merzenich that he began research leading to the implantable cochlear implant in which the understanding of the distinct spectral topography of the cochlea was capitalized on to create a multi-channel device that decoded human voice and allowed that to be mapped into the cochlea through numerous implantable electrode systems. This work is essentially the basis of modern neural engineering and electrical stimulation that forms part of the basis of our own department today. So today we're th thrilled to have Michael with us. And it's also interesting to point out that Michael was recently elected as a member of the nation's Institute of Medicine, one of the highest honors our nation has to, has to bestow. He's an emeritus professor of otolaryngology and physiology, and if I'm not mistaken, the only PhD that holds that honor at the University of San Francisco. He's a founding member of the Keck Center for Integrative Neuroscience at UC San Francisco, and he's received as, in this case, the recipient of the 2008 Ford Distinguished Lectureship. So today, he will speak, us, speak to us on the plasticity of the human brain and strategies for neurologic and psychologic illness. So Dr. Messenrich, please join us today for the Ford Distinguished Lecture. I want to thank uh, Alan Ford myself for the, providing me with the honor and privilege of being here at this great university. Uh, this is one of my favorite places in the universe from the point of view of the quality of science that's been, is conducted here with a long, through, across a long history in biomedical engineering and related science and in neuroscience. And it's just a real, a real joy for me to be here and see old friends here who 
whose work I've followed and admired for many years, and also to see, always see what's happening and how things are evolving here. This is an exciting place, one of the really good places in the United States where things are happening. I want to say at the outset that uh, the science I'm going to talk about is team science, and there have actually been several hundred contributors to it, and they are engineers and, uh, and, and electrophysiologists, neuroscientists of different stripes, psychologists, uh, clinicians of different uh, uh, therapists and medical doctors and other individuals uh, that have brought their special talents to this kind of research. And I, I want you to know that I represent this team. They allow me to speak for them in a sense because I'm the oldest. Uh, and uh, when you see things that come from my lab and uh, someone else is identified as the first author of a study, I recognize them as the first author and give them primary credit. And uh, the fact that my name is on there and I'm old uh, should not lead you to believe that I've contributed it to the main in the ideas that generated those studies, so call them. And uh, you're not going to get a hold of me anyway. <laughs> I also want to say that uh, that I've been allowed by my university, permitted by my university, to contribute to the founding of two companies. One of the companies, and I'm going to talk in the end of, toward the end of my talk about things that these two companies do, and I have a commercial interest in them. I profit by what they do. One uh, company, Scientific Learning Corporation, is in Oakland, California, and it uh, basically uh, de uh, develops and applies training programs that are applied to to help children that are variously struggling and impaired. And the second, Posit Science Corporation in San Francisco, California, focuses on acquired adult deficits or limitations, illness, and so forth. So when I talk about what these companies do, understand that I have, there are potential conflict of interest considerations in my relating this science to you and talking about its values, uh, because there's also profit in, it, in, in, uh, in my participation in it. So I'm going to talk, first of all, about the principles of brain plasticity science. And then I'm going to talk about strategies for, for using, applying this science for improving and sustaining brain health. And then I'm going to lead, that's going to lead us to talk about brain plasticity-based medicine. I hope I'll have time to talk about that a little bit. And then about why you should be excited about this revolution in brain health. So let's uh, think about this machine a little bit. And it comes into the world uh, basically stupid. So if we think of this infant, this happens to be my grandson, Gus. Uh, I can tell you that uh, Gus was born dumb, uh, like every baby is. So if you think of the very limited perceptual abilities that apply, almost no ability to control movement. Babies can suck and poop, and that's just about it. Uh, and uh, there's nothing you could call cognitive, of course. That's well into Gus's future at this point. And, and there's certainly no real evidence that there's anything that you could call uh, that, that relates to cognitive control. And, uh, and there's not really much of evidence of a person there. And, uh, and then think forward, not too many years, to a young lad like this one. Uh, this boy is a boy of uh, 14. And you can see that he's running and bouncing this ball on his head while he's yelling to his teammates an incredibly complex control of movement behaviors in generating these complex simultaneous movements. We know that if we could talk to this boy, we could see lots of evidence of cognitive ability, and his cognitive abilities are progressively developing rapidly, still have a substantial distance to go, but we've seen remarkable changes that have occurred in his ability to control his thoughts and in his uh, reasoning and, uh, in complicated ways. At this point, there's absolutely no question that there's a person here. If we could talk to this boy, we know we would be talking to an individual that in detail is like no other, that is special in, in many, many ways and distinguishing from everyone around him. All of that has occurred as a product of plastic changes from the, through the remodeling of this machine. So that's basically what I want to talk about in this talk. I want to talk about those principles of that remodeling as a lifelong resource that basically has led this boy to this remarkable ability to control his actions, his behaviors, and the evolution of the person that he is. Now, you can see that he's bouncing a soccer ball on his head while he's running, and that probably gives you some hint about where he might be from. So he's from Sao Paulo. And in Sao Paulo, 40% of boys of his age have this ability. 
Now you could go out into Cleveland uh, and look for a boy that has this ability and you'd have, have trouble finding one. And if you found one, he'd probably be from Sao Paulo, <laughs> right? So that's another way of saying that, that the, the way that our brains specialize is very much a function of the culture into which we ha just happen to have been born. And actually, if you think about it, most of your day is spent doing things that apply to a modern life, that apply very specifically to a modern culture. And a, a very large part of your day, most of your day, in fact, is spent doing things that would not apply to the average individual 100 years ago, certainly not to the average individual 1,000 years ago. I mean, 1,000 years ago predated the emergence of universal reading in Western cultures. In fact, that was, you could say, reading, universal reading was invented by Gutenberg, I've heard it said, or by a Swedish king that decided that every child in his kingdom must learn to read on a level in which he could read and understand the Bible in the 17th century. So that's a relatively modern uh, invention. And yet it occupies a substantial part of our brain, and clearly the way that it occupies our brain as we specialize for it, substantially changes our brain from the average person, certainly in the epoch that predated it, which was for most of the history of, of humankind. So we, we are products of our culture and how our brain specializes and how they drive us in the creation of our personhood to really create a model that matches, is appropriate for the cultural environment and the circumstances in the era into which we just happen to have been born. Now the capacity to change our brain basically can, as we de developed an incredible array of skills and abilities, is with us for life. And we know that because we know that the acquisition of new skill and ability basically is accounted for by brain change. That's the only way it can arise. And we know that we have the ability to learn new things, to acquire new ability at any age. So it doesn't matter if we're eight or 80, we know that we can acquire new skills and abilities and we know that at any age that means de facto that we're specializing our brain and that that specialization is, 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 is the basis of that, that acquisition and mastery. So I began to realize about 20 years ago that this represents a powerful, underutilized, lifelong personal resource. That there were potentially many powerful practical uses of controlling plasticity, of controlling this incredibly powerful practical resource to drive brains in useful, corrective, positive directions. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk first about plasticity itself in a very, very superficial way. And then I want to talk about how we, would, how we think about controlling this resource to drive the brains in potentially improving or strengthening or corrective directions in individuals that are in need of help, children and adults. So I'm going to begin by just talking about brain plasticity in very superficial terms in three life epochs. And in this first epoch, the brain comes into the world and basically has to establish control of its own self-development. And uh, I'm going to talk about that uh, in a minute. But that leads us to a second epoch, which applies across, and this is the stuff of relatively early childhood. And once the brain basically can control its own plasticity, it sets up itself into the task of acquiring its primary skill repertoire. And it's heavily engaged in this through childhood and into a young adulthood. And then increasingly it rests on its laurels. And through most of a later adulthood, the brain is primarily a user of th thousands of mastered skills and abilities. So first it goes through a series of progressive changes that allow it to establish control of its self-development. And then it begins to, under its own control, it begins to create its repertoire of skills and abilities that are going to govern what it can and cannot do. And then ultimately it, it carries most of these abilities to a level of automaticity in which it's performing them uh, out, outside of consciousness, operating on a substantially abstractive level of operation. It's primarily a user of them in its operations. It's no longer in a continuous learning mode. So let's begin by going back to Gus again. And uh, Gus is in, the, in, a, in an early period of development that is commonly called a critical period. It's actually, there's actually not a single critical period. There are a series of critical periods that apply across the levels of operational systems. I can't talk about this in much detail. But what I want to say about it that, that is in this period 
in a cortical area that's in the throes of it, plasticity is unregulated. And it's unregulated because the cortex does not yet have any real ability to control it. How could it? So you could say it has, in the early period, the plasticity is a sort of anything goes plasticity. And we've studied this extensively, primarily in the auditory cortex, in which we've demonstrated that any stimulus the animal is exposed to, and all it takes is exposure, doesn't require the stimulus to have any meaning to the animal. How could it? How could the baby animal's brain ascribe meaning to anything, right? So in this early period, any stimulus will drive the cortex to specialize for its representation. So let me take two very simple examples of that. Let's say I expose the animal to a meaningless dumb sound. Let's say something like a repeated tone or some repeated complex stimulus or noise, whatever. The cortex quickly exaggerates the representation of the details of that stimulus. And it's easy to drive the cortex of a baby rodent into a condition in which that overwhelmingly dominates the representational structure of a cortex. Now, I, in other words, I can carry the cortex to the end of the critical period. I can have it be completely dominated in its representation of, of an input that's meaningless to the animal, right? And carry it in almost any direction and distortion that I want. Well, a simple example would be what I can raise an animal in which all inputs delivered into the brain are modulated only at sluggish rates. And what the cortex does, the system does, is it changes its time constants so that it operates predominantly in that domain of sluggish rate. So it's a master, you could say, at responding when inputs are modulated at relatively low rates, but it's completely incapable of responding to successive high rate events. Now I can get a completely, uh, a completely opposite outcome if I simply raise the animal in the presence of sounds that are modulated at high rates, and now I can get a kind of super rat in which the time constants of a dozen or so processes are altered to accommodate for a cortex that's now operating with high dynamic facility. And I can do that just by exposure. I can also raise the cortex with a beautifully elaborate sound repertoire. One of the repertoire that we've used in my laboratory has been the vocalizations of 40 mammals and birds recorded by collaborators that were in the zoo in Zurich. And uh, basically, we raise the animals in the presence of this very complex repertoire of sounds. The, uh, they have no, obviously no meaning to our baby rats. Each, each vocalization is presented in at least seven different variants. So very, very complex uh, exposure in which animals hear the multiple roars of a lion or the multiple call calls of a particular bird or a monkey or whatever. And what you create when you do that in the rat cortex is an incredibly beautifully elaborated cortex. And the cortex has all kinds of feature uh, detectors, abstraction, all kinds of specialization that reflects it picking off those specific sounds in that complex repertoire. Neurons are substantially more selective. They respond beautifully to modulated inputs that represent the features of those com that complex stimulus uh, repertoire that's presented in its environment. Now something just like that happens to a baby like this one, because this baby is born into the world into a language that is unpredictable. And what the cortex does by exposure is to create a nearly optimal processor for the, to pick off the sounds of those native, that native language, to create a separate phonemic representation of the sound parts of words that are going to bear meaning in the language. And that occurs by the operation of the natural competitive plasticity processes of the brain that are brought in motion, you could say, in a non-control, in a non-selective way. All it takes is exposure. And in fact, the phonemic structure of languages are nothing more than the predictable outcome of those competitive plasticity processes. And it's unregulated. It doesn't matter whether the born baby is born into English, Spanish, Tagalog, Portuguese. The, the baby can't know, the brain can't know. It's going to create an ideal processor for whatever it's exposed to. Now what, 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 what is occurring across this period is the brain is achieving its initial sorting. And it's doing this in every domain. And by that initial sorting, it's setting up a capacity to control its operations selectively. Until that sorting occurs, until it begins to create, the, uh, do the, perform that sorting and creating this initial limited aspect of a model of its world. 
it can operate on inputs that are going to be meaningful to it in that environment into which it's born selectively. That has to be achieved for it to take the next step. And the next step is to use selective attention to control plasticity. Now, one of the things that's happening across this period is the machinery is maturing in ways that the brain can control its plasticity on the basis of outcome. Because when it passes out of this period, it's passing into an epoch and now in which plasticity is only going to be allowed when the brain itself allows it to occur. It's going to evaluate the consequences of behavior and on the basis of that consequence, it's going to permit change to occur only when the brain judges that behavior to be in its own best interest. And that carries us to epoch two. I might say this is Gus at his current age. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but I just, just see this little bump right here. That's permanent. He's always running into things, <laughs> including his grandfather. So, um, so I'm going to talk about this within a, within a, by using it as an example of simple behavior. And uh, we're going we're to illustrate that behavior as it's being performed by two beautiful little girls. And you may have guessed that these are my two granddaughters. So this is my granddaughter, Mitra. And this is my granddaughter, Leela. Uh, actually, Mitra is now uh, five years old, and uh, Leela is now nine. And uh, Mitra is learning to use this tool. And uh, this tool is a lever that has a scoop on the end. And you can see that she's taken a relative, she's trying to, the purpose of this tool, of course, is to penetrate this substance. Uh, this substance can be stiff and resistant to penetration, or, or it can have little resistance. Uh, it, once it's loaded, there can be, it can, there, it can be, the weight can be heavy or it can be light. And her task is to load it and keep it upright and deliver it to the mouth, which is out of view, out of sight, and dump it. And you can see that she hasn't really quite perfected the behavior. <laughs> uh, and you can also see that she's still using an alternative method. <laughs> now, actually, she's got a conservative grip because, and this is every new user of a spoon or chopsticks or a tool like this will adopt this conservative position because that's the only way you have a chance of control. But of course, ultimately, you want to bring the fulcrum out towards the end of the lever because that gives you a lot more deg degrees of freedom. And that's what is acquired in the mastery of this tool. And if you think about this, it actually requires incredibly fine adjust, dynamic adjustments in order to accomplish this. It's not all based on somatosensory uh, feedback and uh, fine motor control. Also, you're making judgments based on predictive adjustments that are coming from vision that relate to interpreting the nature of the substance that you have to penetrate and, and, and how that will impact loading and so forth. But it's substantially somatomotor uh, learning operation. Now, if you had to, if you had to, um, if you wanted to build a tool that had the facility of control of a child in acquiring the mastery of the control of this tool naturally, if you wanted to build a machine that had that level of control, you'd have to hire quite a few engineers, and you'd have to do quite a bit of sophisticated programming and mechanical engineering to create a tool that had anything like that facility, and it would be a pretty, represent a pretty big expenditure. Uh, uh, the brain has a relatively trivial way of learning how to control the machinery that un enables the manipulation of this tool. Its strategy is a really simple one. What it does is it basically evaluates the success of a try. And on the basis of its evaluation of success, it looks backward in time and it says, if the try has been successful to the extent to which it, it judges the attempt is successful, it says, save that one. That was a good one. And by save it, what it's basically uh, accomplishing is the strengthening of synapses that contributed backward in time to that good try. So it's strengthening all, of, strengthening all of the connections that contributed to that good try. And it does that iteratively. And tens of thousands of tries later, it has, a control, it has control of this process. And uh, basically, it can uh, make all of the fine adjustments appropriately dynamically in ways that can contribute however those contingencies arise to the successful manipulation of the tool. So it's just a series of, of approximations of the ideal circuitry that would contribute to control. Uh, done through enough iterations, result in control. Results in something close to an ideal processor, basically, for controlling this instrument. Now, how does it decide what good is? Well, in a behavior like this, it has two bases. 
First of all, it's seeking the food. The food is hedonic. The food results in the release of dopamine. Uh, and, and, and dopamine says, in a sense, save it and uh, contributes to synaptic strengthening. You can release dopamine in relation to behavior. It's been shown in many, many experiments, and that results in synaptic strengthening that would, is of this nature. Now, it has another more sophisticated way of judging the success of a try. And that is, it's creating, it knows what a good attempt is, and it's recorded it in its working memory. And it's evaluating the success against its own constructed model of a good attempt. It's watch other uh, individuals, children and adults use this tool this child has. And the child has also been using it for a while. And she's created an increasingly refined model of what successful use is all about. And she's evaluating success against that internal model. And in many behaviors, in ma the, evol the evolution of many of our skills and abilities, this is really the primary basis of evolving control. And again, it releases neurotransmitters when, it, when the system itself judges a try to be successful in those terms, which say save that, that is to say that contribute to synaptic strengthening. So it's a series of, 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 of it's a long progression of selective synaptic strengthening of all of the connections that come from the somatosensory side, from, come from the proprioceptive side, that come from the movement control side, that come from the visual side, that are, that are going to bias this behavior in different ways. It's all of those, strengthening in all of those inputs that contribute to the evolution of this incredibly sophisticated control behavior. And it's expressed in a child like this where the spoon is used automatically. It's used with incredibly high flexibility, flawlessly, in almost any contingent conditions in which its use might come into play. Now, actually, when you look in brains, when you train a monkey to perform a behavior of this complexity, what you see is massive change. And you see it everywhere you look where the, where the, the, where the brain, the, the forebrain is directly engaged in the behavior. And how you could describe that change, you could describe it as specialization for task performance. It's all about specialization. It's all about iteratively, interconnectional change that leads to specialization. And we drive such massive specialization, you could say, in the, in the, in the acquisition of task after task, ability after ability in our plastic brains. Uh, in early life and, in fact, across life. So learning-driven changes are massive. Now, there have been uh, hundreds of experiments like this conducted in animal models and increasingly in humans that have demonstrated the fact of adult cortical plasticity under the appropriate contingent behavioral conditions. And uh, it would be nice if you could uh, could do the grand experiment of revising the input or the form of input into a great sensory system and basically seeing what that great sens sensory system makes of it. And in a sense, that's what you do uh, with the cochlear implant. So this is the cochlear implant, the, the original versions of which, much cruder than this, came from my lab. This is actually a picture that's several years old. And if you were to look at a contemporary device, uh, they're much uh, more, they've advanced substantially since this. This is clunky compared to contemporary devices. But this is manufactured by Simeon, uh, uh, by Advanced Bionics, which is a division of Boston Scientific Corporation. Uh, this is the implanted uh, part of the device. This is the stimulating electrode that's introduced into the inner ear. And these, are, you can see the uh, stimulation contact, the, co uh, the stimulating electrodes arrayed. So this is, this is fed into the spiral form uh, basal cochlea, uh, about 18, 20, 22 millimeters. And basically, the, it is the control pattern stimulation of this on this array is designed to simulate the patterns of stimulation of input that represent complex inputs like speech in the normal ear. Uh, I spent a lot of years in my young life trying to define, determine how to control that pattern stimulation so that simulation was a relatively faithful one. In fact, the simulation is very crude. It's a little bit like playing uh, Chopin concerto with your forearms. You know, basically, you're trying to translate by the electrically shocking a series of separated sectors of the, of the auditory nerve array. Uh, you're trying to represent across, in this case, eight or 16 channels of information because this electrode can be driven in a bipolar or monopolar uh, way. You're trying to deliver pattern inputs that, in fact, is represented in normally intact cochlea across about 30,000 auditory nerve fibers. So it's very, very crude. And it's not terribly surprising 
when you uh, initially apply this device and turn it on, that uh, with very rare exception, what is heard is completely un unintelligible. So people would commonly describe what they hear when the cochlear implant is first applied. They describe what they hear as sounding like robot speech or maybe sounding like a radio that's not tuned to the station or sounding so noisy as to be useless or garbage or trashy. They generally don't like it. Uh, it's annoying. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's initially, uh, they're initially excited because they hear things uh, and initially frustrated because it's so trashy and garbagey. Not too many weeks or months later, the great majority of these people have relatively uh, good levels of open speech reception. So they can track a conversation with their back turned to you. They can talk to you on the telephone. They have a good, a generally competent ability to understand continuous speech. And many of these people reach uh, speech reception rates at 80, 90, 100 words a minute without. In other words, they are as errorless as uh, most uh, individuals of my age, okay? Now, they come from this trashy situation into this er in, the, the, in this epoch in which they have good speech understanding. And, uh, and when they have good speech understanding, they commonly say that what they hear sounds perfectly natural. It sounds what, like what they heard when their, when their speech was intact. Now, we know that the forms of input that are delivered into the inner ear are basically trashy. We know that we've done a relatively crude job of simulating the normal patterns, the complicated patterns of input that are interpreted as speech in the intact ear. And we know that the ultimate evolution of a higher, high level of speech understanding must come by the brain basically developing a basis of reinterpreting these complex distorted inputs. So the, the, the thing that the cochlear implant does that advantages this, that makes it possible, is it represents a devolved representation of the critical details of speech. But it's doing a very poor job of it, really. And the miracle of cochlear implant is not in the engineering, it's really in the plasticity of the brain and the brain's adjustments to this degraded signal that provides a basis of its interp interpretation as intelligible, intelligible speech. I might say in relation to that, one of the questions I asked myself about these devices early on, I may, I, uh, one thing I might say about it is, is that in, in the initial stages, now cochlear implants that come from different manufacturers, there are three primary manufacturers, have evolved to be very much alike in their operational characteristics. They're all more or less, they've all more or less evolved to the same basic uh, designs. But initially, several very different coding strategies were applied. So people basically made very different front ends of cochlear implant devices that generated that pattern stimulation in very different forms. It didn't matter. Now it mattered to the extent that the, that the percentage of individuals that had very good outcomes was modestly different, maybe 70% versus 90% in contemporary devices. But, it, but still, large numbers of individuals that had inputs delivered in very different coded forms recovered understanding of intelligible, of speech as intelligible. And when they, when they, with that recovery, described what they heard as being perfectly natural, like what, what they heard when, when their hearing was intact earlier in their life. The final point is, is that when this, as a consequence of this plasticity, I ask early on, can you expect if I deliver inputs into the brain in a substantially altered form, can I expect it to seamlessly relate to a long history of hearing in this individual in which this individual has acquired all kinds of information from the hearing domain, okay? Can I expect it to, when we think of how I've created all, all of these complex constructed remembered stuff on the basis of encoding that comes in form A, and now I'm delivering inputs in that relate to oral speech reception in form B, can I expect a seamless relationship between now what I hear as it's represented in this new form and all of that stored stuff? And the answer is, it is reconstructed seamlessly. They have full use of everything that they've ever acquired by, by, from oral speech understanding earlier in life, which is another way of saying that the brain is participating directly in the process, in these plasticity processes, in this remarkable, this remarkable series of changes that are occurring that must account for their effective uses of these devices and the evolution of their speech understanding with their operation. 
So from experiments uh, that have been conducted in training animals and to some extent in humans, we know that we can improve at any age the fidelity or accuracy of brain representations. We know that we can progressively improve their power or strength. We know that can, we can improve the coordination or neuronal teamwork that underlies uh, high, high, high reliable representation. You know we can increase, imp change the richness or complexity of representational detail. We know we can increase noise immunity by training. We know that it increases the speed of operations, the efficiency of brain operations. And we know that we can uh, change these basic uh, parameter, per per parameters of, 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 of uh, representation response at every perceptual cognitive executive control and action control level of processing from these many hundreds of adult plasticity experiments. Now finally I want to say before I talk about uh, the practical extensions of this research, I want to say that we've done many experiments in which we've begun by the experiment by screwing up the brain in some elemental way and then driving the brain in a corrective direction or in a positive direction. So I want to talk about just one of class of those experiments. I could use many examples of this. And this is a very uh, simple study that was led by Dr. Etienne de villers sedani uh, who's currently a postdoc in my lab. He's actually a, an assistant professor at the Montreal Neurological Institute that's at, at having completed his postdoctoral fellowship about a year ago, is hanging on for two years with their permission uh, while we continue the, doing these experiments together in San Francisco. And this is a very simple experiment. Uh, we're looking down on the auditory cortex of an adult rat. This is a normal adult young rat. And here we're looking, we've, what each one of these tiles represents is a place in which we sample neuronal responses in the middle cortical layers. And this is a map of its tonotopicity, so this would be a simplest functional map you could uh, drive in this cortex just about. What are represented here are best frequencies, our characteristic frequencies. So this is the tip of the so-called tuning curve, or the center of the receptive field at, at low threshold for for auditory responses. Uh, blue represents sounds in, in the low frequency direction towards red to the high. So you can see an orderly representation of sound frequency across this cortex. This is not a particularly elegant young animal, uh, but uh, this is in the range of what one would see normally. Now you could, we also look at the responses in the cortex in many other ways, or you could look at the uh, basic uh, functional status of the cortex in many ways, or physical status. Uh, you could look at neuronal populations or receptor subunits or, or, uh, or, or, the, or the levels of expression of trophic factors or umpty ump other things in young versus old. So we've done a whole series of such experiments in these, cort in these cortices. I'm just focusing on this uh, simple uh, tonotopic map to start with. And now we look in a typical old rat. So this is a rat nearly three years of age. This is a wild Norway rat. And, uh, uh, and, and we're looking down in its cortex, and it's typical to see that in extent the primary auditory cortex is a little smaller. And the cortex is degraded in its tuning, and what, what the crosshatch areas mean is that the degradation is very significantly different from what would be seen in a young rat. And that applies over most of the hearing frequency range from the middle to the lower frequencies in the rat as a rule. And this is typically what you'd see and tuning selectivity, this is frequency, this is intensity, in a young versus an old animal. So these differences are very significant. Now this is one of a large number of differences in young and old rats. And, uh, and uh, basically what we do is try to determine whether the limitations arising from abnormal development or from change in normal aging are correctable or reversible. We, you could call that rat rehab. Now we've done these rehab experiments in a number of ways, in a number of preparations, trying to simulate the changes that occur in, with developmental disorders, models of schizophrenia or depression or other things like this, this is one that we've applied in these old rats. So uh, you can train these rats in a simple way, and I'm going to talk about the results from training a rat in a very, very simple way. And the rat's basically being trained to detect a target that differs from a series of standards. This is a, so this is a uh, task in which the animal must detect the occurrence of a non a standard stimulus that occurs in the background of, of standard stimuli. And then what we're going to do when the animal detects it is we're going to fade the difference between the standard stimuli and the target. And we're going to change the base uh, st stimulus uh, domain frequently. So the animal's going to make a lot of distinctions. It was just listening for these successive sounds and it has to know whether a sound has occurred in, a, in, a pr in progression that differs from the other. So it has to keep the, the base sound in, in working memory, you could say, and respond when something differs from it. 
a very, very simple task. Now we're going to look down in the cortex as a consequence in an old rat. Here we, we're looking at the tuning bandwidth. So this is a measure that we looked at in the last rat as, as, as impaired. Uh, and then we're going to look at a six-month control. That's in the white. Now we're going to look at the 26-month control. That's in the gray. So we see that the tuning bandwidth is degraded. The bandwidths are larger. Receptive fields are larger. And now we're looking at the trained animals, and you can see that basically the selectivity is restored. So actually, the population of neurons that represent any given simple stimulus in the cortex grows several fold in an old animal as compared to a young animal. It shrinks back to the normal youthful uh, population uh, numbers uh, with simple training. Training, in this case, has been applied for about two weeks. The animal's been exposed to or made decisions across this period of about uh, 10,000 stimuli. So here's another simple measure that you can derive that differs as degraded in young versus old animals that we think is very important. And it's a degree of synchrony as a function of separation of samples of neurons, pairs of neurons across cortical networks. And you can see that here's the, the control young animal. So this is an animal of about six months of age. And you can see that there's relatively higher synchrony, of course, when you're close, and that falls off in a relatively predictable way. And here's what happens in, when you get older. You have these significant differences in this nearby range especially. And when you train the animal in this very simple way, making distinctions about about 10,000 stimuli, it's completely recovered. And in fact, now there's higher synchrony than is seen in the control. Now, these animals, although they're wild Norway rats, are somewhat <coughs> deprived in their rearing. They're reared with other rats so that the deprivation is not extreme, but, but they're not really out in the wild. So to some extent, driving them past center for their age, past the performance abilities of cortex in the young age might reflect that to some extent. But what we see is that in many of these measures, we actually drive the, the functional parameters in, 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 in the cortex to a position up, uh, above the performance that describes the normal uh, young control. Now here's another class of, of change. It's a little bit difficult to see with the lights here. But this is one of a series of indices we have of a physical change. And what we're looking at here is myelin basic protein. And what we're looking at at the top is a myelin basic protein that you see. You see evidence of sort of continuous new myelin formation that's reflected in young cortex. And that's seen in this case in this lower or higher magnification of, of, a, of a little uh, patch of the cortex that we're that is in play in our experiment. And what you see in an old rat is that uh, that almost completely drops off. You see very, very sparse, very, very weak levels of new myelin formation. And now we have a, tr we've trained our old near end of life animal, and we see almost a complete recovery. Now we see in this case, the one difference is, is that there's a little stronger evidence of new myelin formation in the superficial layers. And actually what, we, what we've done in a subsequent set of experiments is change the training modestly and we've basically been able to recover that uh, re-expression. Now, we've looked at many things like this, and uh, more than 20. And, uh, and, and everything we've looked at is, to, is substantially restored. So one of the things that we looked at in, in complicated detail, never mind exactly why, are the dynamics of, of an, uh, in a sort of, of mismatch negativity. And this relates to how the cortex adapts as you apply stimuli that are identical and how it responds to stimuli that are, are, that are different from that standard. And uh, that very, very complex set of changes have to occur for that to, to, to be expressed in the degradation of that capacity. And we believe that the difference in the mismatch reflects the ability to make fundamental distinctions about stimuli that are presented in this uh, paradigm. And we see this almost completely restored. And we also see very substantial generalization in these dynamics to non-trained stimuli. We see emergence of, of new inhibitory neurons of several types, that is to say of the several types we look for, we don't really know if they're new. What we know is that there are four or five times as many labeled neurons that we see with the standard parvobumin and, and other in inhibitory neuron populations as before the animal was trained or in the absence of training. So maybe they're neurons that are underexpressing the things that contribute to their labeling, or maybe they really are new. We really don't know. Uh, that's a subject of contemporary experiments. We see a, a beautiful recovery 
and excitatory receptors that reflect excitatory receptor distributions of young brains. So this very grossly distorted in old brains and we see it almost completely recovered. We see B and F levels that are restored to a youthful level. We see the cortex is rethicken and in a variety of ways we see changes in the neural pill that are, and, and we, this is incompletely documented, but we think that this is accounted for by both the, the elaboration of axonal and, and dendritic carbers. Uh, but the cortex is very substantially rethickened. We see top-down feedback recovered and we've actually set the brain in behaviors and in artificial experiments in which we're looking at the power and the synchrony of feedback from the frontal cortex into the cortical areas that we're studying. We see that, that, both, that it's recovered both in terms of its power but also in terms of its synchronization and we see the time, the loop time from the, from the auditory cortex to the frontal cortex and back to be, to be re to be shortened back to a youthful level to our astonishment. And we think that can only occur through substantial long-range remyelination. We see processed noise in the cortex renormalized. So the cortex is very noisy in these older brains and we see substantial noise reductions occur as a consequence of training and so forth. So we looked at a whole variety of things. And that raises the question, what the hell isn't reversible? You know, what, what is not reversible? So in fact, when you record these changes that occur, and I think from almost from the beginning of time, it's been imagined that the changes that occur in brains from birth or from before birth to death represent a sort of one-way progression. Uh, in some ways, in a positive direction to some peak and then in a downward projection to the end, progression to the end of life. That's just simply not true. Most of the changes that are expressed in brains across the period of life, in fact, are reflecting the operational processes that are reversible. And at any point, you can drive the brain in a degrading or in an improving direction. Now, I haven't talked about it, but we've done many experiments in which we've taken adults at different ages and we've degraded the functional operations of the cortex. We're doing an experiment now in my laboratory. Uh, it's being met, met by a young postdoc whose name is Xiaoming Zhao, in which we've been driving the cortex in and out of a critical period just by manipulating it behaviorally. It's, if we drive it out of the critical period, drive it, we'll let, give it a month out in the free, and then we drive it back in. Wait a month or two, and then we bring it out again, and then back in, and out and in. These are all reversible processes. So we thought of these as representing sort of one-way trajectories to, to degradation and hell. That's an exaggeration. They're subject to substantial reversal in old, older, at older ages. Now the one caveat of that is these experiments are done in rats. And we're really interested in reversibility in us. So that should be regarded as a, a precaution. Now before I talk about uh, practical things, now that my time is almost up, I'm famous for taking too long. Uh, I wanted to just say that there's one more thing that these plasticity processes are created, creating that you probably haven't thought about. And it's really something that you're all very fond of, of course. And that's you. It's created you. And uh, how, it's done, how it's done that is that when you record information, you sort, of course, record it in the context in which you receive it. All information is recorded in context. And uh, basically, the cortex is always operating in context. It's basically a machine that's busy in the process of recording information in serial order so that it can make predictions about what ought to happen next or what could be expected to co-concur with what's, ha what's happening in the present moment. That's a critical dimension of how it must operate to create a valid model of the world into which you, in which you operate. Now, every time it's making an association about what's occurring in context, it's making the association to you because you're always in play. You're the source of its actions. You're the source of its perceptions. You're the internalized source of every thought. Right? So billions of times a year, it's actually self-referencing in associational reference. It's referencing to you, and it's growing you. It's growing you, of course, operationally, because almost everything you do, everything you do in a practical sense that's sophisticated at all, you acquired through the plastic modification of this machine. But it's also very much growing. So the operational you is a product of plasticity. But the you yourself, 
that, that central person that evolves is a product, I believe, of massive self-reference. Now, one of the beautiful things about it is that it occurs on a massive scale with each of one of us having a separate trajectory through life. Our in individual experiences differentiate us, one person than another from every other person in the world, essentially, every other brain that ever was and ever will be because of the complexities of it all. Because it's based really on billions of, of self, self little moments of self-association. And uh, so when we think about the health of individual and the growth of individuals and their personhood, this is also in play, you could say, from, this, from the, the dimensions of plasticity. Now finally, before I talk about the practical dimension, I just want to say this really is revolutionary. The notion that you have a brain that is continually plastic, basically that is alterable, that can be driven to change in useful ways throughout life. A brain that you're not stuck with, you know, at, across the end of a critical period, that, that in which everything beyond that point has to be dealt with as a workaround. A brain that you should not just think of as being over with uh, sometime in, in, in childhood or young adulthood from the point of really altering its performance capacities. That's all bogus. Every brain can be improved you could say significantly throughout life. And basically that's what I want to talk about now. So basically what we've tried to do is to understand over a period of years how to harness this power. And our approach has been to try to determine or understand the origins of neurobehavioral deficits that impact the performance abilities of a functionally limited or impaired human population. And so once we have an, a, 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 an understanding of where in individual limitations come from, uh, the idea is to apply brain plasticity-based strategies that are designed to the extent that it's possible to overcome those deficits. So I want to talk about a few simple examples of that. Uh, our primary targets has been, have been children that are struggling in school who are language reading cognitively or intentionally impaired. Uh, they've been individuals that just as a function of normal aging are losing it on a, on a way that significantly impacts their functional abilities. Uh, we've been very interested in pathological aging, people that basically are in at high danger from, from to collapse into, a, into the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. We've studied the impacts of training on patients that have psychotic illnesses. And again, the whole objective is to try to drive the brain in strengthening or correcting, correction, or correcting or prophylactic directions. And we've done that in schizophrenic patients. We're doing that intensively in bipolar disorder patients, in depressed patients, and so forth. We've been studying individuals that have diffuse brain trauma that comes from uh, chronic brain infections. Uh, we've been primarily interested in models of Lyme disease, in West Nile virus, and AIDS, malaria, and other conditions. We've been looking at traumatic brain injury, stroke, and diffuse brain trauma coming from things like chemotherapy, oxygen deprivation, you know, ID blast injury, things like that, and finally acquired movement disorder. So I'm going to talk about uh, several examples from here. I'm going to focus initially by talking very superficially about uh, training programs that apply in children and then talk about normal aging and then talk a little bit, hopefully, about schizophrenia. So I just want to summarize the impacts that we've seen in ch training children who are language and reading impaired. And our a goal has been to, train, to try to train children out of it by improving the accuracy of their operations as oral speech receivers. So we know that children that are language and reading impaired are inaccurate oral speech, speech receivers. So we basically improve that by aggressively training them in, their fundamental, in the fundamental intrinsic uh, uh, implicit abilities that support Oral, oral speech reception in high speed with high efficiency. Basically, you could say we're trying to improve their accuracy of operations at speed. And uh, but we can drive strong improvements with approximately 20 hours of training in most children that are struggling. And we, we can accomplish that because the training has been developed, has evolved into relatively highly neurologically efficient forms. So we can carry a child from whatever their performance abilities as an accurate receiver, what they hear, to, to, which is defined and automatically adjusted to in these uh, intensive uh, uh, training uh, software uh, paradigms. So we can find the point at which they can make accurate distinctions, and then we can drive them slowly to a normal and ultimately high performance level. And you have to do that basically across in the, in the, in the exercise of multiple processes, uh, but you can accomplish that relatively broadly in about 20 hours in improving listening accuracy. 
Again, we've, folk, we've trained about 1.5 million children today, including quite a few children in the state of Ohio. Again, the training targets the implicit abilities, that is to say, receptive accuracy at speed, that grossly support explicit behaviors. And one of the things that we do in training is we assure that the improvement of those implicit abilities generalizes to explicit, critical, explicit skills and abilities in language reception. Now, we've seen significant benefits, and what you see in a, when the strategy is applied in a clinic, if the child is on the left side of the distribution, that is to say below the 50th percentile, you see a, 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 an average effect size that is in the order of one. So most children on the left side of the, the majority of children on the left side of the distribution with training are driven to the, to the middle or right side of the distribution. So they're relatively large effect sizes. Now when it's applied in schools where the, where the application is more haphazard and the problems of compliance and universal good, good control and training is a little less uh, satisfactory, the effect sizes are a little smaller. They're in the order of about eight tenths of a standard deviation. Now, those are still good effects. And that's what's justified and that's what's driven the extension of this training to so many children out there in the world. The training is game-like. The children like the exercises for the most part are engaged by them. They're a little bit addictive. And, uh, and the children identify them as games. Now, one of the things you see as a consequence is you see substantial improvements with training in the child's reading ability. And the improvement in reading is accounted for because you're changing the phonemic reception accuracy, presumably. And what you see is, is that at the end of training, if the child is in the fifth grade and, say, is operating on the le reading performance level of a third grader, by the end of training, 20 hours of training, the child is operating and reading at about the fourth grade level. So you see over that period of a couple months, a gain of about a year in reading ability. But if you wait two months, you see a gain of an additional year. So what you see in a fifth grader that's two years behind with training on the average is a little less than two years of a performance gain. And that's achieved with 20 hours of training. In, in a high school age child, and the reason that you're seeing that is because you're presumably uh, correcting the phonemic reception accuracy in a way that facilitates the efficient translation of what the child sees, that is to say the orthographic representation of sounds, to, to the hearing-based representation of now a corrected phonemic representation, a corrected phonology. Now, what you see in a high school age child is a little larger gain than that. The average gain is about 2.8 years. And it, the, the gain is larger because presumably the child has struggled at reading in an unsuccessful way for a longer period of time. And of course, when you look at a first grader, the, the effect would be smaller because the differentiation between a failed and, uh, and uh, in successful reader is not very great and so forth. Now, children also move positively across the distribution in achievement test scores. In several states now, if you train children intensively as a listener and you just record the state test achievement scores in the subsequent uh, half years, uh, I just looked at the data a, uh, about two months ago from a school district in Louisiana in the hurricane-affected area, St. Mary's Parish, Louisiana. And in this school district, Louisiana is not a bad state from the point of view of the educational system because they have a lot of oil money. You'd think of it as being a backwater, but it's actually not. Their public schools are really pretty good, but this school district had no school in the, in the parish in which the average performance of the child in a school was, reached a standard deviation below the normal median. So the, these, this school district was in the tank from the point of view of performance. They applied this uh, training program in a series of schools. The average kid in those schools, this is in six of their elementary schools, the average kid in those six schools crossed the normal median on the state achievement test two years later. And that's basically what you see. You see that children from the, between about the uh, 35th and, uh, and the 10th percentile in that range, if you train them intensively, they will cross the normal median uh, within two years. Now, one of the things that we see with, with this training is because we've applied it now in so many children, and because we record the, their performance data in San Francisco, actually in Oakland, in a, in a large database, 
we have a, we have a feedback ar architecture that allows us to control improvements in individual children. So let's say that we've trained now 200,000 children approximately in the state of Texas. And we know now what, how much it takes, and you could say supplementary training, to carry a child to a level of reading proficiency in a school. So basically, we can say on the statistical average, if you do this with this child, in this amount of time, you can expect this child to reach proficiency, which would be, mean that the child is operating at a 70th percentile as a reader. Now, this, this, we're to the point where this process, in a sense, can be closed. We can close the loop because we can measure, we know now how to predict. And in fact, increasingly, we can individually measure this, these transitions in these kids by using this sort of brain plasticity-based uh, training program. And finally, of course, a series of reports have been published now that show that training changes brains. You can look at the child in reading behaviors. You can look at them in attentional behaviors. You can look at them in memory or other cognitive behaviors. You can look at them in language operations and, and everything that's been looked at to, to this point. The training drives brains in corrective or renormalizing directions. The brain looks more normal as a consequence of this training. Now let me talk about a second condition. I have absolutely no idea what time it is. Uh, I'm going to keep going no matter what, but maybe I should find out how fast I should talk. Maybe somebody could tell me, you're being so damn polite. Right. So does that mean I'm already 30 minutes over? No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that brings us to Epoch 3. So this is, e this is a, a period, and I, there are quite a few young people in the audience. You're not all on the decline yet, but if you're over about 30, <laughs> uh, you're heading south. Okay. Uh, so you can demonstrate that decline in a lot of ways, and uh, there are several beautiful uh, longitudinal studies which reveal it. Uh, this is uh, for data that's adapted from studies by Tim Salthaus, who's a professor at the University of Virginia. And uh, you can see that uh, one function here that's sh shown in this graph, this is the z core uh, for the composite, and this is chronological age. So we're going from uh, below 20 to above 80. And you can see that one of these uh, functions is going up, and that's a placeholder for knowledge. In this particular illustration, I actually adapted this illustration. This was vocabulary. So you have to be around for a while to build up your vocabulary to grow knowledge in general, and any measure of knowledge will continue to grow for a substantial period of time into at least moderate to older age. If I had other indices of knowledge, this could continue to grow or level off. It would not show this indication of a little bit of decline, but vocabulary does show a little bit of decline. So obviously, that's the advantage of the older person. They know more because they've been around longer. And even though the older they are, the, more, the less efficiently knowledge is being accumulated, nonetheless, they, 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 the weight of experience does bear, and they do have that advantage. If it wasn't for that, we'd be swamped by the young. Now, one of the problems with the growth of knowledge, of course, is that there's a problem with not, that knowledge being, reflecting currency. So a lot of the knowledge of an older individual is, alas, out of date in a lot of ways that relate to operations in the practical world and real, in real life especially in your occupation. Uh, uh, I, I was reflecting on that again when I talked to the young people at Case, West, Case Today and saw the beautiful things they were doing that put me so out of date, damn. And anyway, I forget that. So almost everything else you measure that relates to brain processing operations is on this trajectory. And that is to say you're, it's in progressive decline from about your 30th birthday. And it turns out that these, so in this case, I could have listed about 100 things on this list, but I put a few things that are representative of the series of faculties that are in decline. You could call it accuracy, speed, memory, reasoning, fluency, a whole pile of things like that, that basically are peaked out at about age 30 and then progressively decline more or less continuously thereafter. Now, there's a tremendous amount of variation in the population. Everybody is not on this uh, slope, uh, but this represents a fair representation of the statistical average. And people in their 70s uh, are at the bottom 20% relative to people in their 20s in these faculties on the statistical average. So these effects are very significant, ob obviously, uh, and significantly limit the older individual. Now, there's a rumor that if you're a university professor, <laughs> or if you're a high-powered businessman, or a medical doctor, 
that, it, that, that, that you won't, will not be on this trajectory because you're really into the, the active use of your brain. It's just simply not true. So in a variety of ways, one of my favorite studies is, uh, was conducted with the University of California professors. Alas, they're on exactly the same function. And every study like that has shown that in, irregardless, it's not your, the, the slope is a little higher, you're a little bit above, you're advantaged a little bit by maybe having a richer mental life, but basically you're on the same slope heading in the same direction. And you might have a few more years of safety before you collapse on the statistical average, but uh, that safety factor is not that great. Now, if you look in, in a variety of ways in, in a given domain, let's say oral speech and language, older individuals have degraded receptive abilities. So in a variety of ways, you can show that they make errors, that they're less accurate. You challenge them at all, especially throw in a little noise, or present information at a little higher speed. So for example, if I take the average 65-year-old and I begin to compress speech, and I say, how much speech compression can they tolerate? It's a very easy to find if you compress by about to about 75%. Older people can make many errors, and you can find a 65-year-old that cannot understand a thing. Now, any 20-year-old, this has absolutely no impact on speech intelligibility, right? The brain operations at high speed. In fact, you can compress to below 50% in the average 20-year-old, and they hear everything, right? So especially when you challenge the brain at speed, you have a really massive breakdown in its operations and accuracy. But even when you look at in, in a non-speed challenge way at accuracy, you see mistakes are creeping in in older brains in, in rich, on a rich level. Now, because information is being shipped around basically at lower rates, and because the, the, the cycle time to deliver information to the frontal cortex of the infant, uh, uh, and then back to the, uh, to the lower level processing areas of the cortex is so slow, you have grossly degraded syntactic abilities. And syntax relates to the brain making predictions about, given the, in the ongoing interpretation of the speech stream, about, in a sense, what, what next syllable, next word is expected on the basis of the pr previous uh, 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 sequence. And basically, that information is arriving so slowly that it's uh, increasingly fraught with error. In fact, on a syllable by syllable level, where normally in a young person, since syntax is operating powerfully, uh, you can show that it's almost completely decoupled. And that contributes powerfully to how, uh, to, to, to the reliability of speech reception in, in, in any sort of, especially in any sort of challenging context. Because you have trashy information being fed forward into uh, memory levels, you have degraded oral speech memory. And because everything is being shipped around with low accuracy and, 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 and deg degradation in in operations and time, you have low processing efficiency. So you can take in relatively information, record it reliably, or use it reliably. In, uh, you're doing that in relatively pokey rates with relatively low efficiency. And of course, you have that's reflected in by decline in verbal uh, accuracy and fluency in, in your production side. Now you can sh show, sh I could illustrate many examples of this, but I'd, I've chosen a simple uh, ask, uh, task to illustrate another dimension of what happens when you get older. And here we're just looking at the ability of a person to identify a little brief piece of sound, recover from it, you could say, and then identify a second little piece of sound in the fastest possible time. So basically this requires that you identify two little pieces of sound in rapid succession. And I'm looking at individuals between age 20 and age 100. I've just taken 100 individuals across this plot. All of these individuals are judged to be normal. And you could say that this is reflecting the sampling rate characteristics of their brains. And you, the first thing you see is that there's substantial variation in every age group. So there are individuals that are slow in, in, in basically making these successive signal judgments in every age group in this normal range. But you can see in the average there's a substantial degradation from uh, about six to eight samples per syllable, you could say, to about two samples per syllable by the age 80, 85. So there's a very substantial degradation. You can also see that some older people are doing quite well, but some older people are really in the tank in processing information at speed. Now, a, a, a series of special problems apply to vision, and one of the pr things that applies is that as, you're, as you age, basically, you intensify the sampling in front of your nose, 
at the expense of re retaining accurate sampling and high speed processing in peripheral, peripheral vision. So when you're young, basically you see from ear to ear and, you, and you're basically taking the information in a relatively broad, on a relatively broad scale and you're relatively accurately operating on things that you're at least drawn, your attention at least drawn to things that occur away from the field of view. But as you get older, basically, the field of view contracts because you're predominantly operating in vision in, uh, directly in, uh, around the center of gaze in front of your nose. So the consequences is that you contract from having a wide screen view, which we saw initially. Uh, by the time you're 80, the visual field is contracted by more than 50%. So this is what you effectively where you can operate. And one of the problems with that is we live in a high speed world where it can be really important to see things that occur in those positions, right? Uh, and, uh, and basically, that ability, that wide screen view, is substantially attenuated in old brains. So you could say that in an old brain, uh, in a young brain, you have a, uh, you have a high definition, wide screen view of the world. And in an old brain, basically, you're, you're back to the old, uh, the old fuzzy TV with the, I'm almost done. <laughs> so and basically, as your, as your quality of life de 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 declines, uh, for most individuals, uh, uh, independence is compromised before the end of life. And we have this, uh, this sad situation in, in contemporary society that we now have, once you live to be 65, uh, you're expected to live into your mid-80s, but in fact, the majority of people in their mid-80s can no longer sustain themselves independently. So basically, where a guy like this is heading is for the rest home. Now, what accounts for these changes in abilities to grow older? Well, one thing is that you're not practicing enough in ways that would sustain the elemental neurology that could support your high accuracy operation and operations at speed. And you're also not engaging your brain in enough new learning and the learning machinery of the brain that's really controlling uh, uh, changes in the brain, progressions in the brain, your abilities are being degraded uh, because, uh, because that machinery is slowly dying. Uh, staying active is not good enough. Basically, what you need to do is maintain uh, a history, a schedule of new learning, of, of, of true new learning. Uh, the good news is that any brain can be strengthened, that is to say, protected at loss in old people just as in old rats at any age. And so what we've done is construct a series of intensive training programs that are designed to do that. And again, the basic strategy is to attack those implicit abilities. I didn't do that. <laughs> those implicit abilities and drive them like, as we would in a rat and drive them so that they approach the abilities that apply for a younger brain. And, and, uh, and then to assure that those, uh, that those improvements generalize to operations in oral speech reception or in language usage or in vision or in whatever. Now we've created two touch training programs and we documented in scientific studies the values of these training programs by measuring a lot of things in the visual and the, and the listening domain. And uh, many of these studies have been con uh, uh, conducted by a, c a contributor to this research who is Carleen Ball at the University of Alabama at Birmingham who created one of the key components of our, of our visual training program. And, uh, and others have been conducted by scientists who have collaborated with our groups in San Francisco. So here are just a few things that we see change significantly in control population studies and control populations. So these are all in gold standard intent to treat tra training trials in which we're looking at uh, in, in an epoch after training and in some cases extending out to five years or more after training has been completed earlier in life. And that applies to a number of the measures, experiments that were conducted by Carleen Ball. Uh, so brain speed in listening is substantially improved. You can basically improve the operations in listening performance abilities. You can measure this physiologically. You can measure it uh, behaviorally to the performance levels of about a 30-year-old, 20-year-old, 30-year-old. I'll talk about one example of that in just a second. Brain speed and vision, the same thing. You see very dramatic improvements. You can drive the, oper the fundamental neurological operations, the time constants that now govern processing or look like that, those of the young brain. Skills for daily living, uh, you can basically show very strong improvements in the operations in daily living. Uh, you can show improvements of physical and mental health. You can show the speed of everyday skills. You can show improvements of working memory, long-term memory, mental competence, numbers of falls. Are the people still driving? I mean, improving the, their operations in vision 
and their quick responses to things that occur now across the wide field of view has big impacts and improves their driving. They keep their driver's license, they're driving more frequently, they're driving longer distances, they're driving at nights, their crash rates are slow, they have half as many accidents, they're much safer drivers and blah, 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 blah. Now actually, because of these strong effects that were demonstrated primarily by Carlene Ball on driving, the training program that we've, that we've developed that, we, that begins with her training program that was elaborated beyond it is now being offered to every individual over 60 in the state of Pennsylvania insured by Allstate. And will soon be offered by them for free for everybody in the US over 60. Because they know that it has very positive impacts on driving statistics in these older individuals. And you're gonna see this sort of training strategy applied widely because it also improves things that relate to the bottom line for health insurers. Because you can increase the probability of independence. Someone that has to pay for someone when they lose their independence is very strongly interested in basically providing this to those people so that basically they can sustain their independence for longer epochs. The same with physical and mental health. If you were trained in the right way five years ago for 10 hours, in a simple, the simple visual training strategy of Carly and Ball and colleagues, then about $1,200 less was spent in the subsequent five years in your health care. Now that might not matter to you, but it matters a lot to somebody that's paying for that health care. Uh, and the main payer, of course, for someone over 65 is the federal government. Now finally, you can look at a basic skill like this one again, and you can look at the consequences of training people that's accurate listeners at speed, now you see similar results with visual training, but what you see is, is that you can recover this ability. So again, you remember that before training, because the individuals in this controlled intent to treat trial were at age 73 on the average, you can see that then the average are right where they, 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 they're supposed to be in relation to this distribution. Now we train them, and actually they're performing at the level of performance of a relatively young person, or you could say of the best on the average of individuals of their age that weren't trained. So basically, a, a basic faculty like this can be s restored by intensive training. Uh, so finally, you can look in the brain, and you can see the brain has changed, and finally, we look at these programs and use sustainable strategies to address a variety of other human conditions. And all I can say is that we're making progress in all of these areas, that we're driving very substantial improvements of the brains of a right, wide variety of individuals by using the same basic approach. I wanted to talk about this primarily in the domain of schizophrenia where our research is the most advanced. We have very powerful impacts on people that have chronic schizophrenia, far beyond the impacts that have been recorded with any drug. When we train individuals that are at risk for schizophrenia onset, we can actually strengthen the brain to the extent to which, to this point, no prodromal child that we've trained, these are individuals between about 14 and 22 years of age, and none of the 21 20 or 21, I'm not really sure how many people have completed the training, none of them have acquired the disease. More than half of the controls have. And in fact, we just had a meeting uh, several weeks ago in which we made the decision that we could no longer not train control subjects. Uh, it looks like a condition like that is probably preventable by forms of intensive training that basically drive the brain in corrective and strengthening direct, directions. You're going to see in the next year a whole flurry of papers in which these training uh, strategies have been applied in schizophrenic patients and bipolar disorder patients, in which in almost everything you can think of that is judged to be wrong about their brains and their organization are driven in a corrective direction by intensively training them. They, that substantially the pathology that's expressed in such individuals are reversible. You're going to see this science expressed widely in the world. You're gonna see it, in a sense, uh, before too many years in almost every home. And you're gonna see it replied very widely as medicine. One of the challenges that we have is to try to understand how we can get the medical community and you uh, to, uh, to view brain plasticity-based therapeutics as medicine. And that's basically one of the challenges that we're trying to address. So this is in your, your future, it's in uh, medicine's future. Uh, these strategies will ultimately be applied to, uh, to address problems in legions of people. And uh, I hope that, and this is a natural place where a substantial contribution to this uh, development of this science 
in the, in, in the, in the, into the practical extensions of it in the world could be uh, richer and uh, could make a strong contribution. And I, I thank you for, for listening.